Okay, uh, the benefit of the DFP over the rank one update is that the, uh, the HK plus one is guaranteed to be a positive definite matrix as long as HK is a positive definite matrix. So it's that it inherits the positive definites of the HK. Okay, and this is, a, is described by the, for, by the theorem below, uh, which says that as long as the gradient is not zero yet, and the HK was a positive definite matrix, then the way using the DFP rule to get a, the HK plus one, it will be still a positive definite, definite matrix. And to show that, let's see that to show this HK plus one uh, is positive definite, we said there are multiple ways to show a matrix is positive definite matrix. And uh, uh, the definition is that when you multiply a non-zero vector X on the left and the right, you get a positive number. Okay, this is the one, this is the way that we're going to use to, to prove this uh, positive definiteness. So when we multiply the X on the two sides, uh, according to the update rule, we just multiply X on the left and the right to the three terms. Okay, that's the, this is the uh, DFP. If I will erase those things. So we just need to multiply x on the left and x on the right. And similarly, I need to multiply x transpose and x. And here I'm going to multiply x transpose and x, x transpose and x. Okay, and they turn out to be, they turn out to be this. So first term, second term, third term. Now everyone is a scalar. The numerator is a scalar. It's just a square of this inner product. And this is also a square of the inner product. All right, and that's this. Okay, what I we need to do is to show this is a positive number. Uh, well, this must be a positive number because we assume the HK is positive definite. And this must be, uh, this is a, we need to, what we need to do now is to show this minus this is still, is also a positive number. Okay, and to show that, we think we have lots of uh, complicated notations. So we just, uh, uh, for simplicity, we just denote the vector A by, I denote this, this matrix times X by this vector A, and this half of this matrix times this by vector B. So this matrix means that the square root of the HK matrix. So if I have a matrix A, then the A half A means that if you multiply this matrix, you get A. So this itself means some matrix. It just multiplied by itself. It just give a, it will give us original matrix A. So for A, uh, for a positive definite matrix A, uh, this this A half uh, the root of A is actually straightforward. So for example, if A is symmetric and the positive definite, then we know that A is equal to U transpose lambda U. This is the eigenvalue decomposition of the matrix A. U is orthogonal orthonormal matrix. Uh, lambda is a diagonal matrix with positive diagonal entries. So then in this case, the A here, this lambda is just uh, lambda one through lambda n, all the others are zero. Then the one, then the A half will be just equal to U transpose lambda half U. And this lambda half, or the root of lambda is just the square root of each one. And you can easily show that when you multiply the A uh, root of a by itself. You just multiply this with itself, then you can easily get to this, which is a. Okay, but this is anyway. This is the idea. This is the the meaning of the root of a matrix, positive definite matrix. So I'm going to define this to denote this by b and this den denote this by a. And uh, yeah, this is what I said. Said that uh, it's a positive definite matrix. Okay, so what, the reason why I'm going to do this is because now I can split, I can split this HK to two of the its square roots. And then what I have here is just the A times B. Okay, 
Okay, and the here I will just have the b uh, trans b times b itself, so a square square norm of b. Okay, something like that. So I'm going to see what happens. Um, as I said, the this becomes this plus these two, and since we uh, use the Since we used uh, this shortcut notation, what we get is this. Will be this one. Okay. Uh, so let me show you why. So this term actually didn't change. It's the same thing as the second term. It didn't change. But this one, as I said, this numerator here becomes a times b. Right. You just see that I split the hk to the product of the, the square root of its short square root. So I got a transpose b on the numerator. So a transpose b square on the numerator, the denominator is just a b transpose b, which is just a b square. Okay, and here, uh, again, I'm going to split this to its uh, square roots. So this is just the a square. Okay, so I have a square here, and I combine with this ratio, I will get this. Okay, so actually this is the, the first term where the b cancel it, we just have a square. And this is the the last term. This is the second term, I didn't change it. Okay, now what I need to show is just to show this is a positive. This is a positive number. Well, the new way, the first term must be greater than or equal to zero. That's for sure, because of the cauchy schwarz inequality. We know the inner product of the two vectors is giving us a scalar, and this number must be less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of B. So when I score it, it's still true. And this uh, is the numerator here. So that's why the numerator here it must be non-negative. Okay? And also, this will be positive, or non-negative at least, and this one, I just need to show that this is a positive number. Well, to show this positive number, we call that the delta xk is equal to alpha dk, right? And uh, the dk was set to negative hk gk. So I have this. And now I can replace delta xk by this. And that becomes, well, I have the, the delta xk replaced by this, uh, um, just for, uh, give, leave it for a moment. So the, this is my delta xk, and I have this delta gk equals to that. All right? And uh, recall that the g, this is just the alpha k dk. So recall that the gk plus 1 is perpendicular to d0 through dk. And this is just alpha times dk, it's scalar times dk, so that's why these two vectors will be perpendicular, and the inner, inner product of them is equal to zero. And I only have this and this left. That's giving me this. And now I'm going to use this one here. This just replace delta x by that, and I have the two negatives canceled, and I have alpha k, I have this uh, hk gk with another gk, so that's giving me this. Okay, and because the uh, hk was a positive indefinite matrix and gk is a non-zero vector, we know that this is a positive number. Okay, this would be a positive number. Okay, so they're all non-negative. Okay, uh, we haven't finished yet. We want to show that this will be actually positive if x is non-zero. We only show that it's non-negative. To show that it's a positive, we just need to show that these two terms, I know that this is greater than or equal to zero. This is also greater than or equal to zero. If I want to show that this is positive, the sum is positive, I just need to show that these two terms cannot be zero at the same time. Okay, they cannot be zero uh, simultaneously. Okay, uh, so how do we show this? Uh, let's suppose that the first term is zero. 
and we need to show that if we, this first term is equal to zero, let's show that this term has to be uh, positive. Well, uh, if the first term is zero, as we said, that means that we got equality for the Cauchy Swartz equality. We know this is less than or equal to a times the b. So if the equality, if this, there is equality, that means the a is perpendicular, a is a par parallel to b, or a can be written as some scalar times b, or the other way around, doesn't really matter. But uh, let's say that uh, that's the case, then they are, par they are parallel to each other, they, they're pointing to the same direction, it means a is equal to beta times b for some beta. Okay, and if that's the case, uh, recall this is our a, this is our b. So this is just equal to beta times this. And now this is a this is a uh, hk is positive definite, so that means this is a uh, this is a, this is a positive definite matrix as well as we showed. If you have all this as positive numbers and square root of them, it would be positive numbers. So that means this is also a positive definite matrix, so I can cancel them out. Now I'll end up with this. And now let's check. I want to show that this is a positive at this time, and that just means that this numerator needs to be strictly positive. Okay, to see that, let's take the square of that. Uh, I will just show that x equals this. That means this x is replaced by beta delta gk. That would be that. And then recall that uh, the alpha, this delta xk will be just alpha k times dk. So I have alpha k dk here, and alpha k, will, alpha k and the beta will be pulled out uh, as this, and then with the inside is this. Right? And now, uh, recall that we will have uh, I think I'm missing a yeah, uh, this part here inside I have delta gk transpose dk but delta gk is gk plus 1 minus gk transpose dk. But I know that the gk plus 1 is perpendicular to dk. So when I multiply these two, they will be gone. I only have this times this. And the negative is inside the square, so it doesn't matter. So that's why this term becomes just uh, this gk dk. Okay? And also recall that dk was defined to be hk gk was defined to be HK, GK due to the uh, Newton, quasi Newton update rule. So it's negative HK, GK, but again, the negative is gone since we have a square here. So I replace it by that. And now it's clear because uh, this is strictly positive, right? Because GK is non zero, HK is positive definite. So it's strictly positive. Beta is a positive number. We said that the alpha and beta cannot be, uh, it should be pointing to the same direction. Uh, and the, both of them are non-zero, so beta has to be a non-zero number. And alpha k is non-zero, as we said, the step size uh, was a positive number. Uh, and then all together means that this, when this term is zero, then this term must be positive. Okay, so they cannot be, uh, they are both non-negative and uh, they cannot be, be equal to zero at the same time. That's why this is actually greater than greater than zero when x is not zero. Okay, that's finished the proof. Uh, the third and the last uh, algorithm that we're going to introduce is called the BFGS algorithm. Uh, so it's named after the four people, uh, Broyden, Fletcher, uh, go from the Shannon. So this is, a, uh, compared to the previous two, this is probably the most uh, well-known and widely used method uh, for quasi Newton's method. So the idea of the BFGS method is to uh, replace the HK matrix 
uh, in the quasi Newton's method. Uh, recall that the for quasi -Newton, in quasi Newton's method, the HK uh, is required to satisfy this uh, equality, right? The HK plus one times uh, delta GI is equal to delta XI for all the I less than or equal to K. So that's the requirement for quasi Newton's method. But BFGS instead uh, is trying to find the B, B matrix. So uh, instead of using the HK, they use the BK. So the BK is like the inverse, is actually the inverse of HK. And because of it is inverse, so I'm going to apply the inverse on both sides of this equation. Now I'll cancel up this one. So if I multiply the BK plus one here, and then I have the BK plus one here. So these two will cancel. And uh, the BK in the BFGS method is um, satisfying this. Okay? It satisfies this. Okay, so you see that the only thing that changes is that the H is replaced by B and the delta G and delta X are switched. Okay, so this is essentially what the BFGS method is trying to do. But how does this actually work? Um, the BFGS is simply replacing the HK matrix by BK and exchanging the delta X and delta G in the DFP algorithm. This BDLP algorithm is the one that we just mentioned. Um, so if we do this, then recall what the, the DFP method was. This this one, right? So let me remove those things. So as you can see, the uh, they replace this by B. And then replace this by G, and this by G, and this by X. Again, this by B, this by X, this by B, this by X, this X, this B, this X. And that will end up with the B matrix update in the BFGS method. Okay, and now when you look at that, oh, you look at that, you see that's the one we just, um, I just uh, wrote. Okay, so now the BK matrix is updated in this way. But recall that we cannot use this BK for the quasi-Newton quasi method because the quasi-Newton method or is updating, uh, updates this D, DK, DK, vect, uh, DK direction by negative HK, GK. So we actually need this HK to, to compute the search direction dk. Uh, but right now we only have the b bk matrix. So we cannot just replace the bhk by bk inverse, but because we need to know what is bk inverse, right? Compute as we know that we should be very uh, concerned with the inverse here because the taking the inverse of such big matrix is, is very expensive. Uh, but it happens that it turns out that this if we just simply do this uh, BFJS change, the inverse of this BK is not really difficult to get because it can be obtained by the, uh, the H matrix. So we're essentially still updating the H matrix and the update for the H matrix can be obtained in the following way. Okay, so recall that, uh, suppose we already have the HK matrix. Okay, so we don't, although we, required the BK matrix to satisfy that. But what we actually get is this HK matrix in the last iteration. Now the next iteration, we're going to get BK plus one. And we want the BK, the inverse of BK plus one to be HK uh, plus one. But we only know that the BK plus one is related to the BK uh, according to this formula here. According to this bunch of formula here. So I know that the BK is plus something minus something. So I do know this. And the question is, if I know that the BK inverse is equal to HK, and my BK plus one is equal to BK plus uh, and minus these two vectors, what is the question is, so what is the HK plus one? 
Well, the HK plus one is updated by the following one. We call that HK plus one is just the, the inverse of BK plus one. But the BK is written by this. So this whole thing here is this BK plus one, as we showed in the previous slide. And now I will just plug in PK plus one and take the inverse of this, stream, this matrix. Apparently that's not uh, obvious. Taking inverse of the matrix may not be that straightforward. However, in this case, because the BK matrix is added by this and this vectors, uh, and both of these two vectors are rank one matrices, uh, rank one matrices. As you can see here, let me erase this. Well, here, this denominator is just a so this denominator here is just uh, the inner product of two vectors. So this gives us a scalar. Uh, similarly, this one in on the denominator is a row vector, the matrix, and the column vector. So it also gives us a scalar. And both of these scalars are, are positive, actually. Uh, the reason is, recall that the delta gk is equal to q times delta xk. And the q is positive definite. That's why the denominator is positive. We call the delta xk is non-zero because uh, we're still making updates. So delta k is not zero. And similarly, we always assume that the previous hk uh, is invertible or is positive definite, and that the bk is also positive definite. We also need to come, uh, keep this property for the bk plus one and hk plus one. But say that suppose the bk and the hk are, K are positive definite, then we know this is also a positive number. So these are the denominators. The new vector, um, this delta gk is a column vector. This is the same vector, but it's a row vector. It's in the row form. So the new vector here is a rank one matrix. So this one is rank one matrix. Similarly, the bk times delta xk is a matrix times a vector. So altogether, this is still a column vector. And this is just a transpose, form, uh, transpose of the same uh, column vector, which is row vector. So in the numerator, you will still get a row vector times a column vector. And that gives us a square, rank one square matrix on the numerator. So now you can see this is just rank one matrix divided by number. This is another rank one matrix divided by number. And that is a special structure of this B matrix. And we're going to use this structure to get the inverse of this BK plus one. Okay, to actually do this, we actually need this lemma. It's called sherman morrison formula. Uh, so what this formula says is, suppose you have a, a non-singular matrix A, or invertible matrix A, and you have a two of column vectors, U and V, they are the same dimension as A. So A is N by N, U and V are both N by dimensional uh, column vectors. And now if this A is invertible, and at the same time, this number is non-zero. So what this number is, is a one, just a scalar one. Uh, v is the row form of this vector V, a inverse is the inverse of the matrix A, since we know it is non-singular, so the inverse uh, exists. So this is a row vector, a matrix, a column vector. So this gives, gives us just a scalar. And then we have just added by, by one, see if, it's a, see if it's a zero or not. If this A is invertible, and this scalar is non-zero, then this A plus U V, now this A is a square matrix, this U is a row vector, it's a column vector, and the V transpose is a row vector. So the UV together gives us a rank one matrix. This A itself is a matrix. So this two, the sum of these two matrix, uh, matrices will be invertible. Okay? And the inverse of this matrix is given by this formula. Okay, uh, so remember that this N by N matrix here, N by N matrix here, the second matrix is rank one. The inverse of this uh, matrix is the difference of this m by n matrix, which is uh, uh, a inverse. And here, 
this gives uh, give us a zero column vector. This gives us a row vector because it's a row vector times a matrix. So column vector, row vector. Denominator is a scalar, so it's just a just a scalar. So again, it's a rank one matrix divided divided by a scalar here. So now I can see uh, the inverse of this is just can be computed by this. So as long as you as long as we know what the inverse of A is, and we can guarantee this is non-zero, then the inverse of this A plus UV transpose can be written in this way. It's exactly this way. All right, so uh, the computation of this, uh, the reason for this is actually easy to check. To check that this is actually the inverse of this A plus UV transpose, we can just directly apply uh, Make this computation, which is the A plus U. We just need to try uh, to multiply this by A plus U V transpose and see if it's, if we can get identity. Right? So we just need to multiply the A inverse minus A inverse U uh, V transpose. A inverse divided by 1 plus V transpose A U. We just need to multiply this to A plus U V transpose. Let's see what we get. Okay, and you, we can just directly break the parentheses, and there will be four terms coming out. Let's see, the first term will be A inverse times A, which is the product of these two. And then I will multiply this one to A which gives me minus A transpose U V transpose A inverse times A. So I multiply the matrices on the top, on the numerator, and denominator is just, just a, always a constant with a scalar. And that's the second one. The third one, I will multiply this to this, and then this to this. Okay? So I just uh, do that one by one. So I get A inverse times U V transpose. And the finally, I will get, uh, let me write on the next line, it will be A inverse U V transpose A inverse times U V transpose. Again, um, divided by the scalar rate. Okay, just be always be careful with the dimension. Here, this is a column vector. This is a row vector, a column vector, a row vector. Okay, um, now we can uh, make some cancellations. Apparently, the first term, A, trans A inverse A, gives us uh, the identity matrix. And then here, this uh, A inverse A also gives us a... Uh, Identity matrix, right? So I'll keep, uh, I'll just cancel up these two. Um, and then I'll have this A inverse U V transpose, which is a matrix, a column vector, and then a row vector here. And this is the same as this one. So this part is the same as this part. So I will just uh, uh, keep these two together. And uh, besides this term, there will be uh, also this constant. So I leave the constant uh, together with the third term. So I'll have sum of minus 1 over 1 plus V transpose AU. Uh, that's for the constant of the second term. And the third term has just constant 1. And they're all multiplied to this. OK. So now um, let's see the the last term. This last term here is a matrix, a column, a row vector, a matrix, a column, a row vector. Okay, so I can put these three together because this these three things together is a scalar right it's still a scalar 
So I can uh, just uh, just pull out the scalar outside of this, and I will get minus v transpose a inverse u over sorry it should be inverse here it should be inverse here and also this denominator is one plus is the inverse as well so one plus v transpose a inverse u so right now this ratio uh, is a ratio of two scalars and I will still have this is what happens when I pull out this as a numerator and this as the denominator as here and then I will still have this part and this so that's this is the same as before it's just the a transpose u v transpose so actually this term and this term they are both uh, the same matrices matrix they're the same matrix and uh, but here the their con their uh, their coefficients is this scalar plus one minus this okay but you can see that uh, this coefficient minus this coefficient it will give, just give us zero because the coefficient here and this together or just a one minus I put one first one plus V transpose a inverse u and the lastly, I will have V transpose A inverse U, 1 plus uh, V transpose A inverse U. As you can see, uh, if I make a common denominator of the last two terms, the uh, sum of the numerator, the sum of these two numerators are the same as the de denominator. So that's why this two sum together is just a 1, so it will be canceled with this one. And that's why Although I have this matrix left, but their coefficients add up to zero. So I only have, so this whole thing will be just gone. And I only have the identity. And that verifies that this is actually the inverse of this matrix. Okay, so this is actually a, a special case of the so-called sure, uh, sure complement. Which says that uh, if you have a two by two matrix, uh, let me show you the formula for that. So suppose you have a two by two matrix. This is the A, B, sorry, two by two block matrix D here. Um, so it has several, several different forms. Uh, the simplest one is that. This A and the D are both um, square matrices. So let's say this is N1. I mean, the, there are N1 columns here, N2 columns here, and N1 columns, uh, rows here, and N2 columns here. So N1 and N2 could be different. But if you do this, then we know that A is the upper left of N1 by A1 matrix, and the D is the lower right N2 by N2 square matrix. The B and the C may not be uh, square matri matrices because the N1 and 2 could be different. But in this case, the inverse of this matrix is shown to be right under some condition. Uh, but let me write it out and you can see what conditions it actually requires. So the uh, the inverse of this two by two matrix. By the way, this n one and two can be really large. It doesn't matter what uh, how, what is the size of this n one and two. Uh, but generally, the inverse of this matrix is this: a inverse plus a inverse b. The d minus c a inverse b inverse the C A inverse okay and uh, this is uh, the second block is negative A inverse B D minus C A inverse B so you can see this uh, D minus C inverse C A inverse B appears several times so it's also it will also be here 
times C A inverse. Uh, and the last way is just a, just D minus C A inverse B inverse. Okay, uh, this is the one of them. Uh, the key is this matrix. As you can see, we uh, to compute this new two by two matrix, uh, we really require to find the A inverse because the A inverse appeared several times, right? A, A inverse appeared in those places. So we need to know that A is invertible. This square matrix A here is invertible. And also we need to know that this D minus C A inverse B is invertible. You need to take an inverse of this. And this is a, uh, because this C A inverse B, this A inverse is N1 by N1, just the same as, sorry, N1 by N1, just the same as A itself. The C, as you can see, the C should be N2 row, should have N2 rows and N1 columns. So C will be N2 by N1, and B similarly is N1 by N2. So all together, this is the N2 by N2 matrix, and that is the same size as the D. That's why we can take the difference of the two, just the two N2 by N2 matrices. And then we need to take the inverse. We need to take the inverse. So this D minus C A inverse B is called the sure complement of the matrix against A or on A, okay? Because we first take the inverse of A, then compute this. So this is called the sure complement. And if A is invertible, and the, the sure complement on A is also invertible, then we can compute this First of all, we can compute the, the lower right column, column uh, corner matrix, and then it will appear here, here, and also here. So we'll, we'll, once we compute it here, we can use it in other three places. And also, in, at other three places, we needed the A inverse, additional A inverses. But all the others are just the B, B or C, just directly applying, multiplying B and C. So those are cheap, but the A inverse and the inverse of this sure complement, they are expensive. But if you can do these two inverses, then the two by two block matrix here has this as the inverse. Okay? So this is the one where you can put this, uh, you can do the inverse of D, and then you can make a sure complement on D uh, as well. And in that case, the sure complement on D will be A minus B times uh, D inverse times C. Okay, so you can do either way. And there's also some uh, other type of uh, sure complement. If you, you if uh, B and C are square matrix matrices, and A and D are not necessarily square matrices, you can still, uh, we, we can still uh, obtain the sure complement or the inverse of this two by two block matrix. Well, uh, the connection between the sure complement and uh, this formula here is that you can treat a, you can treat this, you can apply the sure complement to this matrix. This is A, and you have U here, and the V transpose, you have negative one here. Okay, this is still a two by two block matrix. It's just that this is uh, N, so this is N, this is one. Uh, so there are N columns, and the, the last day, for A and then there's a one column for U because U is a row, a column vector, right? And then you have N here and a one here. So here, you still have a two by two block matrix. It's just that this is the N by N matrix. This is a column vector, this is a row vector, and this is just a single scalar, okay? And then you can apply the sure complement as I just mentioned here, because this, uh, the so-called sure complement will be just a, uh, on A will be just uh, according to what we said here, will be just uh, uh, the A inverse, and then recall this. The this is like the B, this is like the C, this is like the D. Okay, and so this will become the. Uh, just compare with this formula. The D will be negative one now. 
the C will be the V transpose. The A inverse is just A inverse here, and the, the B will be just the U here. Okay, so the sure complement is this, which is just the negative times 1 plus V transpose A inverse U. So the negative doesn't really matter, um, because we all can always change the sign if necessary. But the key is that right now, uh, we, if we know the A is invertible, and we know the sure complement of A is invertible, but right now the sure complement of A is just this scalar here. It's invertible means that it's non-zero, and that's why we require that this one is non-zero. Okay, and then the inverse of this two by two matrix, we can just apply the formula there. In the that's uh, and the uh, by that we can we can show that the formula for the inverse this. So actually, to really get this, we also need the we actually need the, the other sure complement I, I mentioned, but I didn't wrote. This the other sure complement is on on the D. So uh, you just. Uh, uh, you can Google or Wiki, check Wikipedia for the sure complement. There is a the sure complement on D. That means you need the uh, the D to be invertible. As I mentioned, D is invertible. And the sure complement on D. Then here you should have A minus B times D inverse uh, C and uh, some other things. And this would be inverse. So this is sure complement on D. Uh, then uh, you equate this one and this one, and to finally get this formula. To finally get this formula. Okay. Um, so that's that's basically it. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, actually, I actually didn't say that. It's just uh, this will be scalar already for our case, for our case here, and these two are easily computed, and I see exactly this one. Yeah, so you don't really need this, but there's another one like this one. If you do the shortcoming on this, but this one, this one itself will be suffi will suffice. Okay, so uh, I said a lot about this. It's just uh, to mention that this is actually not a some kind of magic, uh, uh, or you can call it, it card be, but the the original form is a so-called sure complement, a theory of sure complement. When you have a two by two block matrix, uh, we can get the inverse of that by taking the inverse of uh, either this one or this one, and also the sure complement of that uh, that submatrix. And uh, this would be just a special case. Okay, and now let's go back to the previous one, why we can use this to uh, to this formula here. And uh, the reason is, as I said, uh, we, are need, we need to take the inverse of this sum of these three matrices, but uh, both this second term and the third term, they are rank one matrix matrices, or they can be written as uh, a row column vector times a row vector. So uh, for simplicity, you can treat this whole thing as the matrix A, and you can treat this whole thing here because this numerator is a column vector, denominator is just a scalar. So you can treat this as the U, and this is a V vector or V transpose. Okay, and then you end up with this form. Okay, the A is the sum of the first two terms. Then you have a row column vector times a row vector. So you take the inverse of that, will be just the inverse of the first matrix, uh, will be just the inverse of the sum here, will be just the inverse of the sum. And then the inverse of this sum, so you need to find out the inverse of this. And this, you can again treat it as uh, a matrix A here, and then this together is a column vector divided by a scalar. So this one together can be treated as U, and this can be treated as V transpose. So it's again like A plus U times V transpose. And we're trying to find the inverse of that, and that is again this formula here. So after you do this for twice, as I mentioned, then you end up with this formula for uh, for hk plus 1. The inverse of this whole thing, this, these three terms, is essentially just uh, this uh, long equation here. Okay, so people have de derived this, so just uh, apply the uh, the lemma we had on the next page twice, and then we'll get this. Okay, so if you're interested, 
interested and you want to uh, give some time, just uh, uh, you can sit down and uh, try this for maybe one or two hours. You can figure it out. But that's, this is the formula for the H matrix. Okay. And now you can see that although we uh, for the BFGS method, the uh, the f at the first place they just simply switch the H and the B and delta X delta G, uh, but eventually they still need to find a formula to update the H matrix because H the matrix is used to to, uh, to be multiplied to the gradient and find the uh, the search find the search direction DK, and this formula tells us that. If you have the previous HK, then you can compute the next HK plus one by using this formula. And everything here is uh, already computed because you have the HK. So those HKs should be you should be able to compute them. And then you have the delta K, delta G, and delta X. So those are the uh, the things you need to compute. And here, uh, just to quick conclude here, the HK will be updated by uh, this is a this is a scalar, as you can see, because it's a row, a square, and a column vector. So it's a scalar here, inner product of two vectors, still scalar. So O in the parentheses is just a scalar, and the, this two ter this term here has a scalar on the denominator and a row a column vector row vector, which gives us a row rank one matrix on the numerator, and also the denominator is. Uh, Oh, sorry, the last one is this is a uh, again a scalar. This is the row vector. This is a this is a square matrix, a column vector, and a row vector. So it gives us a uh, rank one matrix again because we can multiply these two together, get a column vector, and then multiply this row vector. And this vector is just a transpose of the this matrix. Uh, this matrix. So this is a matrix that is transpose of the previous one. So it's also a rank one matrix. Okay. And actually, this uh, this is that this is the BFGS. So you, when you implement it, it should be just straightforward because you can just uh, follow this formula, type in to the code, and uh, that will that will be it. Um, and it's not difficult to verify that when HK is invertible, and this HK plus one is also invertible, and that it can be checked easily by uh, multiply the the two sides by x and x transpose and x, and see if it's still positive. Okay, so we'll save. We did this uh, uh, analysis for the DFP method, uh, and for BFGS is also true. Okay, uh, you can expect that because the BFGS is just a switch, changing the notation for the for DFP. So you inherit a lot of uh, the same properties from from a DFP, but it appears to be more stable and more robust than the DFP method. Okay, so in summary, uh, in summary, the BFGS method is just uh, using the uh, H matrix update to obtain the H, ma H matrix. Um, so initially, uh, set iteration number to zero, and uh, choose a initial guess, and uh, choose a, a, a symmetric and positive definite matrix H zero, which you can just choose this identity matrix, and then compute the gradient G zero. And then you can start iterating. Uh, the first step is to get the uh, the descent direction. Uh, well, this is a typo here, so it should be just this k. Uh, the superscript k means it's a Hessian matrix, so this is the k. So initial at the first iteration, the h k is just zero. The g k g zero is just the, the gradient, uh, as we showed in the first step. And then you get d zero. Once you have d zero. You can compute. You can do the line search uh, to find the, for example, here is the second method to find the, the uh, approximately find the, the steep descent step size. Recall that if this is a quadratic problem, then this arg mean has a closed form solution, as we have been doing for the conjugate gradient method and also the, all the previous the quasi Newton's method. So if it's a quadratic function, if it's a quadratic function, this alpha k, you don't need to compute. You don't need to do this line search. Okay. And then once you have the alpha k, you have the dk, you can do this uh, decent step. right? And then once you have the xk plus 1, you can compute its gradient. And then once you have the gradient, you can compute both uh, delta x and delta k. Uh, sorry, delta x and delta g. And use this formula, use this formula uh, where you 
it involves HK, delta XK, delta GK. So you can compute everything, you will get the HK plus one. And then you can move on to the next iteration. You have the new G, you have the new HK, and then you just compute the next uh, search direction, DK. Okay. So just iterate this. And since this is a quasi-Newton's method, as we uh, showed earlier, uh, these DKs will be also conjugate, uh, conjugate Q conjugate directions if this F is a quadratic function. And this method is guaranteed to converge with the N steps. Um, so that's the property uh, we can guarantee for the quadratic problem, for, for F being a quadratic function. For general function, we, not, we may not have this property. So we have to, first of all, we have to need to do the line search, uh, but we can do this very approximately, maybe just a very few iterations, and then can move on. Uh, it doesn't have to be accurate. And uh, the other thing that we need to change is that since this method is not guaranteed to converge with the N steps anymore, uh, when this f is not a quadratic function, so maybe after n iterations, you need to reinitialize this dk to the uh, gradient, and also reinitialize this hk to identity matrix, and then continue. Okay, so it could run more than n steps. Okay, so that's the the DFP, BFGS method. All right, so uh, this is all for the quasi Newton method. Uh, we introduced the three algorithms. Um, the rank one, the rank one uh, up correction method, and uh, the uh, DFP algorithm, and this BFGS algorithm. Uh, this appears to be the most uh, famous one, and uh, still the state of the art until today. Okay, and uh, most of the packages, including MATLAB, a uh, software including MATLAB and uh, Python, they all have this function implemented. Um, so you can search this name and uh, you, and uh, and see how to use them. Okay, uh, now we start with a new chapter. Uh, it's called the linear programming. Okay, uh, so this compared to the previous uh, chapters, linear programming is the first constraint uh, uh, optimization problem that we consider. It's probably the simplest uh, constraint optimization problems, uh, but it has lots of applications in the real world. So that's why it has been uh, it has been extensively studied in the past few decades. So the linear program, or simply called uh, LP, is a uh, minimize optimization problem where the where the objective function is a linear function of x. Uh, so can, as you can see, it's just a linear function of x, and uh, x is the variable to be found, and this c is a given scalar, uh, it means given vector, same dimension as x. Uh, it doesn't matter if you add some constant or not, uh, because it doesn't change the minimizer here. Okay, so uh, for simplicity, we just, uh, we just have the c transpose x. And the constraints are linear in the sense that we will have a uh, equation, a system equation to satisfy the x uh, needs to needs to satisfy needs to be a solution for this linear system, ax used to be, and uh, also uh, there will be a inequality constraint, which uh, in the standard form is written as a negativity of x. Okay, so this compose the uh, standard form of a linear program, and uh, as we as I just mentioned, the c is a uh, uh, given column vector, A and B are given as well, A is a matrix, B is a vector, and also X needs to be non-negative. So here this means that uh, every component of X is non-negative. Okay, so it's, uh, when we write this uh, as two, two vectors, so this means that this inequality holds for, uh, for each con corresponding compo component. Um, so again, x is the unknown variable to be solved. A is a, uh, a matrix that is given, and usually A is, uh, has less fewer rows than columns. So the A looks like this: this m rows and columns. 
A, and the, uh, we consider a case where A is full rank, means that the rank of A is M. It's just equal to the number of rows, and B is given. Uh, that's the standard form for linear program. Okay, so uh, a few things. Um, the uh, other types, there, in, in general, the, the linear program or a problem could be written um, in a different way uh, compared to the previous, uh, previous one. But they turn out to be a linear program as well. For example, uh, maybe in practice you would like to maximize the C transpose X rather than minimizing it. Okay, and uh, you may be interested in uh, you, you may have this inequality constraint instead of uh, equality constraint. Previously we have AX used to be, but you may have just this. And all this can be this problem is actually the it's actually also a linear program, as long as you see the objective function is a linear function of x, and the constraints, uh, no, doesn't matter is if it's uh, doesn't matter if it's equality or inequality, uh, as long as this constraint, as you can see, this is a kind of linear system, uh, although it's an inequality uh, in this linear system, but it's still linear system, and also this apparently is a linear function of x. So as long as you have everything as linear functions, then uh, linear functions of x, you can, this is a, a linear program, and it is, it, you should be able to convert it into the standard form. So for example, this one, uh, maximizing this, uh, we know how to do this. We can change this to minimizing, uh, minimizing the negative of this. So you can put a negative sign to uh, in front of C, you can make C to be, make C as negative C, and then you change this maximization to minimization. Okay, so it's like we you minimize you maximize f is the same as minimizing negative f, right? So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that see here we wanted a equality constraint. So, uh, but this is inequality. How do we do it? Do it. So this a simple trick or very standard trick here is that. Uh, this happens because there is some gap between ax and b, and this gap is uh, non-negative because you can just add a non-negative vector, uh, we call it a y, so to make up this, to fill up this gap. So I can add a, a non-negative vector y so that this ax plus y will be equal to b. And it also requires this y to be greater than or equal to zero. I just add one more constraint here, so previously we only have this x non-negative, but now you also have y non-negative. So this y is a m-dimensional vector because it has to have the same dimension as the b or the number of rows in a. So it's a it's a m-dimensional vector, uh, which will be different from the dimension of x. And also, uh, uh, why this uh, why this is the same as a linear program problem is that we can consider x and y both as unknown. So we can combine them uh, together and become this becomes a n plus 1, that n plus m dimensional vector to be solved. Okay, And then th this one apparently I can rewrite this as, well, right now I say I have the z vector, which is the the concatenation of these two vectors x and y. Just put this stack these two column vector, vectors. It becomes a m plus m dimensional vector. And now, uh, apparently, this one, this last inequality can be translated into z greater than or equal to zero. I right? just need every component of z to be non-negative. And uh, here, the equality constraint becomes this a and i. I put this together and multiply z equals to b. And as you can see, uh, this is again just a, a m rows, n columns, and this is m columns. So uh, if your x, if your z is x, y, then multiplying this matrix and this column vector will just give us this. And on the right hand side is still b. So I'm treating this as the new matrix A.
it's like the new matrix A multiplied to Z. And now the new uh, the uh, objective function. So similarly, you can put this negative C, and then uh, I can put negative C and then zero. I put the transpose of this, and then Z. Okay, so negative C, we stack the negative C vector and the zero vector as a long column vector, M plus N dimensional column vector. And then this new objective function is just the inner product of these two vectors. So now I'm minimizing the Z in the subject to the constraint here. And as you can see, this, uh, this will be my new C vector. This is my A matrix, new A matrix. And this is a standard form as this one. Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, for some problem that uh, is uh, that has linear functions everywhere, including the constraint and the objective function, then uh, you will be able to convert this into the standard form of LP, into the standard form of LP. So uh, when we develop algorithm, we only need to worry about how to uh, solve the standard form because uh, if you have some other linear problem, you should first convert it into the standard form and apply the software. All right. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, by the way, here, this y vector is called a slack variable. Uh, it is used to, to fill in the gap between Ax and B. Okay, so it's pretty standard form uh, trick in linear programming. Okay, so um, let's look at a concrete example. Uh, say we have this so we have this um, uh, linear program, which is uh, uh, which has let's say two variables uh, in a vector. So the vector x should have x one and x two. Okay, just a two-dimensional. Okay, and the the uh, objective function is maximizing this, and the constraint. Uh, the constraints are this, so you have a linear constraint, you have this kind of linear, but it's absolute value, so uh, apparently what you, we know how to do with this. This is just telling us that this is essentially just negative 2, less than or equal to x2, less than or equal to 2. So I can split this into, this is equivalent to that, and this is equivalent to, uh, I want, uh, E quality constraint, so I will need to. Uh, well, let's do another trick as we showed below. Just forget this. Let's do another quick trick later. You can see that's even easier. Uh, okay. Anyway, so here I will have. Um, notice that I will have this. I have this next x one less than or equal to zero, but in practice I want something greater than or equal to zero because we always want x greater than or equal to zero. So we can replace this x1 by x1 prime, uh, but x1 prime is nothing but just negative of x1. So x1 less than or equal to 0 is equivalent to x1 prime greater than or equal to 0. Okay, um, x2. Okay, so we can, for any number scalar, we can write it as the difference of two scalars, u and v. Uh, and the, both of them are positive. Right, any number can be written as the difference of two positive numbers, and this is what I'm going to do. Where we're going to replace x two by u minus v, and uh, uh, if we do that, then uh, the the absolute value of x two less than or equal to two is like the difference of u and v is between negative two and two. Okay, and finally. Uh, as we said, this will give us u minus v less than or equal to 2. And also, uh, for this part, I will have minus u, if we have move u and v to the left, minus u plus v is less than 2. Okay? 
So uh, I can introduce the select variable. I have u minus v plus x3 is equal to 2. And x3 is greater than or equal to 0. And here, this one is equal to negative u plus v plus x4 equals to 2. And also x4 is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, uh, so this one is exactly the one here. And also x3 needs to be greater than 0. And this one is the same as this one. I just take a, ne take, just take a negative sign on both sides. And also x4 is greater than or equal to 0. So now I, uh, what I did is replace x1 by x1 prime. In the x2, I replaced it by u minus v. Uh, u minus v. So I introduced, uh, re I replaced x2 by u and v, substituted by two new variables. And also we introduced the two slack variables. And now this problem becomes, let me write it out. We are maximizing the x2 is u minus v. And x1 is becomes the plus x1 prime. And the constraint, again, x1 is x1 prime, negative x1 prime now, equals to u minus v minus 5. And here, x2, absolute value of x2 less than equal to 2 becomes this u plus minus v plus x3 equals to 2. And negative u plus v minus x uh, plus x4 also equals to 2. And uh, now the x1 prime, u, v, x3, x4, they are all non-negative. Okay, uh, and now there's a slight change I need to make. Since the objective function is being maximized, so I want to put it as uh, minimizing it, I will need to put negative sign here, then this, and also the third one is negative negative x1 and then I can replace the maximum by minimum and now everything is ready we can write it into the matrix form uh, because right now uh, the vector I call it the z vector will have this x1 prime u v x3 x4 there are five variables and then the, the uh, objective function becomes the inner product of, as you can see, uh, the inner product will be uh, z and this vector, which has negative 1 for the x1 prime, negative 1 for u, 1 for v, 0 for x3, 0 for x4, and z. And the constraint is... I just need to summarize the three equality constraints. Uh, in the first one, I will have negative 3, and then negative 1 if I move u to the left, and then 1, and 0, 0. And the uh, second row, I will have 0, 1, negative 1, 1, 0. The third one will be 0, negative 1, 1, 0, 1. And multiply this to z. And uh, on the right, I will have negative 1, 2, 2 left. Okay? A negative 5, 2, and 2 left. And then I also have the z greater than or equal to 0. So this is the standard form of a linear program. Okay? So I said this is just a summarizing what I have earlier, and then we can easily write this as the standard form. Okay, uh, now let's look at a concrete example uh, from real applications. So we have, uh, suppose we are uh, we're working or we're uh, working on a factory that wants to, and we want to manufacture four products, uh, four types of products, and they have different requirements for a cost and the budget. In the their profit are also listed below. And the, the question is uh, to find out which 
how many uh, quantities we should make for each product uh, to maximize the profit. Okay, so now uh, the four products are listed here. The first product is this as is this one. So um, it to make one unit of this uh, product, we need one man week labor and need uh, this amount of uh, uh, material one, and this amount of uh, materials two, material two, and uh, we can make this kind of profit uh, by using uh, by making one of this uh, this product, one one quantity of, or one uh, unit of this product. The so similar for it, uh, for the second, the third, and the fourth, and uh, uh, we. Cannot just you know if you want to maximize profit, just make as many as you as possible. But the problem is that uh, there's certain budget for making those things. First of all, we have limited manpower, so the the labor, the total labor, uh, the budget on the labor is that we can only have twenty in total. That means it doesn't matter how many you put on each one of them, the sum of the labors they need it should be less than equal to twenty. Okay. So, uh, so for now, you can see that we're going to say we are trying to make make out x1 unit units of p1, and x2 units of p2, x3 units of p3, and the x4 units of p3, p4. So these four variables, four numbers, are to be determined. So my variable x actually contains these four numbers, and the point is that. Uh, if we want to make x make this many uh, units for these products, then I need to use x1 times 1 plus x2 times 2 plus x3 times 1 plus x4 times 2. This many of mine weeks or manpower. So that has to be less than equal to 20. And similarly, we need to uh, have this budget on the material 1 and have this budget on the material 2. And the profit we can make is for every unit we make for P1, the profit will be 6 times X1, and uh, will be 4 times X2, right? so on and so forth. Okay, so now the thing is clear. Uh, we want to decide the value of these four numbers, or the quantities for each product we, want, we need to make, so that the profit is maximized. And, uh, and the constraint is that these uh, constraints need, need to be satisfied. So apparently, as we said, the profit is written by this component-wise product, right, between this. So it's like this column, this vector times this vector. So this vector is 6, 4, 7, 5 times uh, this, this vector, so that's just this. This is the objective function that we want to maximize. At the same time, we need to satisfy the constraint. So as we mentioned, uh, when we multiply this, make an inner product of this vector and this vector, it needs to be less than equal to 20. So that's the first one, okay, inner product of the two vectors. And this inner product of this vector and this needs to be less than equal to 100. So that's the second vector here, Se second inequality here. And similarly, the third inequality. And also, um, we need to uh, <clears throat> make sure that this point quantity now is greater than equal to zero because we cannot make a negative units. Uh, here we assume those numbers are real numbers rather than in uh, integers because usually this could be in a very large number. Uh, could be, uh, for example, you're making uh, x1 uh, times a thousand boxes or a thousand units of this one. So x1 is just standing for uh, the number and it will be multiplied by thousand. Uh, we actually make it so this x1 could be a uh, may not be an integer. Similarly, for this one, they, they don't have to be integer, uh, or they can be rounded to a near uh, integer number if you set them to be you know uh, in the different units, like in the thousands or something. Okay, so for this problem, we don't require them to be integers. All right, so that's uh, we just need them to be real numbers. So that's the final form, and apparently you can rewrite this into the standard form of linear program as we said earlier, and then try to find 
a method to solve it. And that is the purpose of this chapter. We're going to develop methods for solving the standard form of RP.